This episode is brought to you by Courier. Your application speaks to your users with notifications, but what do you do when your users each respond better to a different channel? Building the event triggers is annoying enough, but when you have to build templates for multiple channels, track deliverability and performance, and manage granular user preferences, you end up with overwhelming complexity that distracts your team from your core product. That's why Courier built its API and notification system as a service. Courier is the fastest way to design, manage, and orchestrate all of your applications and notifications using a simple API. The UI is a powerful drag-and-drop editor to help you build and send templates over any channel while giving your users full control over their own preferences. Plug-in providers like Twilio, SendGrid, Mailgun, and Firebase to send email, SMS, push, in-app, or even direct messages like Slack, WhatsApp, or MS Teams. Get started today with 10,000 notifications free every month. No credit card needed. Just go to courier.com slash code story. That's C-O-U-R-I-E-R dot com slash code story. This episode is sponsored by Imagely. If you're ready to add photo or video editing to your application, Imagely is a great place to start. Imagely provides a software development kit that handles all the technology for adding photo and video editing right inside your application. Their SDKs are fully customizable and can match your app's look and feel and support all major platforms. Let users share beautiful photos or videos, create imagery for marketing campaigns, build photo books, or even automate design with templates. Their video and photo editor SDK is used by Shopify, Hootsuite, Shutterfly, and hundreds of other companies, helping them ship software faster. The Imagely Software Development Kit is the fastest way to add photo or video functionality to any application. Visit img.ly slash codestory today to try the web demo. That's img.ly slash codestory. IP Info has a, it's a freemium offering. We have a free API that allows for you know, anybody to make up to a thousand requests a day completely for free without even registering for an API token. The thinking behind that was, like I say, when I launched the very first version, hey, this will be used by hobbyists and developers. To make it really easy to use, you don't even need to sign up, call it through a command line or a simple bit of code, and you know, everything will work great. We suddenly got to this point where we said, hey, you know, we, we think we have hundreds of thousands of free users using the free plan. We had no way to reach out to all these free users that you know, love the free offering, but no way to even kind of communicate, hey, here's all the new cool stuff we're doing. You know, no way to get in touch. I'm Ben Dowling. I'm the founder and CEO of ipinfo.io. This is Code Story, the podcast bringing you interviews with tech visionaries who share in the critical moments of what it takes to change an industry and build and lead. A team that has your back. I'm your host, Noah Laphart, and today how Ben Dowling spent an evening building a tool that is your trusted source for IP address data. All this and more on Code Story. Ben Dowling lives in Seattle and loves it there. He is married and a father of three kids, ages 11, 8, and 5. So he's a busy dude. He loves to hike and recently took his family on a weekend trip to Mount Rainier. He loves to snowboard and get away from the screen, though he admits that tech is also his hobby, building side projects, apps, websites, etc. Ben was working on a bunch of different side projects in 2013. The process to get IP info was manual, tedious, and filled with headaches across those projects. After he felt this pain point multiple times, he decided to build a solution to solve it not knowing that he would quickly start getting millions of requests in a short time. This is the creation story of IP Info. So IP Info, um, at this stage, we're a, a company, we're about 20 people. We build IP address contextual information data sets. So that's IP geolocation. We'll tell you if an IP address belongs to a mobile carrier or not, and which carrier. We do privacy detections. So we'll tell you if an IP address belongs to a VPN or a public proxy service. Um, and you know, a bunch of different data sets that give context to IP addresses for, for lots of different use cases. How it started was uh, a simple API for IP geolocation data. And so I've been working on a bunch of different side projects and each time needed you know, IP geolocation for, for different things. And at the time, this was back in, uh, probably back in 2013, uh, to get set up with that, you had to download a file, you had to upload it to a server, you had to set up cron jobs to make sure that it updated each month and, you know, 
something would go wrong with it, you'd have to SSH into a server and fix it. And you know, I had a bunch of different projects and a bunch of different servers where it could all go wrong. Uh, and so I wanted to solve that, that pain point of, hey, let's make this easier and just have an API. I could have one server that had this data. I could make sure that one server was downloading the data and updating it. Uh, and then just you know call it for my other services through an API. Um, and so then, you know, instead of, hey, I've got four projects on the go, four servers, I've got to make sure that, it, that, that it's keeping this up to date. Just one place. That's the only place I have to worry about. Wrap it in a simple API. Uh, and then, you know, the other projects can just use that. And thought it could be useful for other developers too. Uh, so just sort of launched it as a, as a really dead simple API. Just, you know, pass an IP address in and we'll give you the geolocation data back. Um, and launched that. And very quickly it started taking off. And, you know, I figured it would be useful for other developers, you know, working on hobbyist projects like I was, and you know, maybe want to do a few hundred lookups a month. Um, but, but very, very quickly, uh, it started getting, you know, I saw some people making millions of requests a month, and I thought, wow, you know, there's people using it for, for, for things I kind of hadn't even imagined. And sort of dived into that more, found out what people were using it for, um, and, and commercialized it. Thought, hey, you know, if there's people making millions of requests a month, I, I figured it'd be developers making hundreds of requests. Let's add some paid plans, see what happens. Um, and people started paying, and so you know, the, I started devoting more and more time to it, uh, and started building out new data sets as well. So you know, initially, like I said, it was just an API, but then as more and more users were using it, as more and more kind of people were seeing our data, um, that at the time that you know, our product was just the API, it was a thin layer around around existing data sets. We started getting feedback, people saying, "Hey, you know, you've got my location wrong. You know, it's saying I'm in Miami, but really I'm in you know maybe really I'm in in San Francisco." Uh, and initially, we were like, "Hey, it's not our data. You know, go go report it upstream." As soon as it gets fixed, we'll just put in the data each month, and, and you'll see the see the fixes. And we get more and more feedback saying, "Oh, the data's wrong. Can you fix it?" And so then we we started down a long road of, "Okay, well, you know, can we produce better data ourselves? Can we do a better job and actually solve the data problem?" Uh, and then sort of work on adjacent data sets as well. So people would say, "Hey, you know, it's showing I'm in San Francisco, but uh, really I'm on a, a VPN that's going through San Francisco. Is there any way you could flag that?" And so I started looking into you know different data sets that our customers and, and users were were interested in. Um, that kind of helped them solve more of their problem. And so you know, now we've got a, a big data science team and a big team of data engineers that, that work on building out those data sets, improving those data sets, you know, improving the accuracy, coverage, quality. Uh, and still, you know, our API is still really popular. We get about 40 billion API requests a month. Lots of people calling the API over, uh, to look up this data, but we also offer the data as, as, as downloads. You know, we have companies embedding our data within their products or using it for you know, different things internally. And so we've sort of evolved to a, a full sort of IP address uh, context data business. Let's double back to the MVPs, that first product you built. Tell me about how long it took you to build and what sort of tools you used to bring it to life. The very first version I built in an evening. Um, I was actually traveling to Seattle at the time, so I was, I was living down in the Bay Area and I was I was traveling to Seattle. Um, I was staying in a hotel and I got a. Um, I was I, I was visiting a website and it said something about Texas and I was like, this is weird. Why is this website telling me I'm in Texas? You know, like, am I really in Texas? Uh, like, you know, is is what's like? I'm I'm actually in Seattle, right? But this website's giving me an ad for Texas. Is it just a really badly targeted ad? Um, you know, it, it, am I actually on an IP address that goes through Texas? Like, like what's going on? And I was just curious about it um, and wanted to kind of find a way to plot an IP address on a map and just, you know, what even is my IP? What is it on a map? Um, and was kind of Googling for stuff and couldn't find anything. And, you know, so I'd already been playing with geolocation data and, you know, sort of combined with the idea of making this API and just thought, well, hey, I could just register a domain to today, put up a simple website um, and debug this issue and so I just registered the domain that night built a very very simple version of the website that just you know showed your IP address and it showed a little um, you know Google Maps widget um, just on the, on the web page and that was the very first version that was a simple website and so that was you know I did that within a couple of hours and then over the next few weeks that's when it sort of evolved into the API idea where it's like okay this could this could actually be a really useful way to you know, solve my headache um, on, on the developer side be helpful to other developers and so you know it's something that I was dabbling in um, you know a few hours here and there as a sort of a sort of a side project uh, and so I guess the, the it evolved into the simple API after a couple of weeks um, and then you know some API documentation and, and posted about it to a few places so I'd say you know probably within like five or ten hours but over the first month it evolved from this really simple domain that just showed your IP in a map to okay then there's you know an API that you can pull this data down programmatically the product makes so much sense and is so needed. With any you know 
early MVP product, right? You, you have to make certain decisions and trade-offs. So tell me about some of those that you had to make in that first MVP, either in the, you know, in the evening that you built it or as you progressed it a little bit, as an, in, it's still in the MVP stage. But tell me about some of those decisions and trade-offs and how you coped with those decisions. Some of the big ones were that, you know, I, I was I, I'm more of a, a back-end developer, right? Certainly no, no designer. Um, and I, the, the, the back-end stuff was fun. The API was fun. And so all my focus and attention sort of went there, right? And that was um, partly, I guess, a, a skill set thing, right? That's just what I enjoyed doing and where I wanted to spend my time. But ended up really focusing the, the I guess, the initial version. Um, you know, and as I launched paid plans and all these things, you know, all the effort sort of went into the API and nothing on... Uh, like there wasn't even a an account that you know there was nowhere to log in right um, and so people would you could subscribe there was a page where you could put in your card but it just called the Stripe API you had no sort of user database we just used Stripe for payments um, if someone wanted to uh, you know, find out how many requests they'd make they'd shoot me an email and I'd, you know, I'd run a query against the database or if they wanted to, to update their card details they'd have to shoot me an email and I'd create a one time link where they could go in and you know, it, it'd use the Stripe API for them to update their, their card details but the all the effort and energy went into hey let's make sure the API is you know really reliable make sure there's low latency um, make sure you know the, the data fields are there that the users want and really focused on that rather than any of the the other stuff that sort of seems essential right oh well, there should be a way for a user to log in and update their payment details there should be a way for users to log in and, and see their request volume um, and obviously all that stuff came later but when it was just me doing this you know a few hours a week. Um, I, didn't, I didn't. I didn't even build that. that. You know, it's not like, I, like it's like, hey, I've not. I've got limited time to spend on this. Let's spend it all on the the reason that people are, are coming to use this, right? That no one uses a product specifically because there's a great dashboard, right? Um, it's something that that users expect. But those initial users, you know, the product was solving such a pain point for them, they didn't really care that that wasn't there, right? And they were early adopters as well. Um, you know, they were happy to shoot me an email um, and just, you know, I could run a database query and email them results. And that, you know, I think we continued that way for probably almost a year, uh, maybe even longer. And, you know, it got to the point where it's like, okay, I'm, you know, I'm getting five emails a day for people wanting to update card details or wanting to know their request volumes. At that point, yeah, let's bite the bullet and, and build out something really simple where people can see it. But, you know, for the, for the longest time, uh, I avoided basically anything that wasn't kind of essential to, the, I guess, the core sort of value proposition that's really easy, a really easy way to get geolocation data and make sure that it's really reliable, kind of fast. Um, and, and not worry about all the other things that you kind of expect in products, but they're not going to differentiate you from, from anything else. So then from that point, you start to progress the product and mature it and execute on building new things. How did you, how did you go about building your roadmap and figuring out, okay, this is the next most important thing to build? It's a great question. It's, I guess it's evolved and, and still evolving. I think in the very early days, there was just so much that obviously needed to get done right it's like hey you, you, you kind of there's this thing that people are using people are paying for it um and people are kind of putting up with a half-baked product right they're saying hey this is really useful but hey you know i, I kind of really need this data field as well can you build it um or hey you know i i, I need it at higher volumes or you know there's infrastructure issues where it's like oh you know that we're going to have trouble scaling past the next set of users or whatever but they just you know clearly there's just a big backlog of stuff that, that absolutely must get done I think once you're past that, um, then you've got lots of different sort of paths you could take in, the, the, in terms of what to build, right? There's no obvious thing that needs building. There's no kind of priority one thing that just has to get built. Um, and there's you know probably three or four different things that we're all hearing from different users uh, could be useful to them. Um, and you know, they would be either completely different data sets. They would be improving the quality of the data sets we've got. They could be you know, completely different features. Uh, and I think that the, the way that we sort of attacked it um, was... You know, what are we getting the most sort of requests for? Um, and then how useful do we think that would be to other people? And also, I guess, how how well do we think we can do a, a good job of that? Um, and you know, where does it fit into to everything we want to get done? And so we, there are some things that we said, well, hey, this, this doesn't fit in with what we're doing. You know, people would say, uh, hey, we're using your data in this way. We'd really, you know, can you build a great UI that, that, that shows me some stuff? Um, and we, hey, you know, that's that's not my skill set. That's not our skill set, right? We're really great at building an API. So if you're wanting a really fancy UI on top of this or a way to kind of integrate it with your product, that just doesn't make sense. You know, that might be useful to a bunch of our users, but that's not really where our skill set is. And it, may, it makes sense for you know for our customers to do that or someone else to do that and build on top of our API. But then the things within the API, 
Um, there might be different data sets. So people might say, hey, you know, I'm interested in you know, you're developing your IP to company data or interested in um, you know, carry detection. And so for those, we sort of looked at it and said, well, how, how, how good a job do we think we could do at this? You know, if we think we could do an okay job, um, it might help this customer. Um, but if we can't do a really good job, you know, is this worth us sort of investing our time and effort in? And so we, a lot of that was sort of prototyping and figuring things out. But the areas we sort of really doubled down on were areas where we were kind of getting feedback from customers that, hey, there's not really a good solution out there. Um, you know, we thought we had some great data internally, so we'd be able to build some, some really good data sets out around it and then focus on areas where we thought we could you know really launch something that that was you know we had a a, a really good shot at building a, a really kind of quality data set around it that would be useful to customers so a lot of it i guess was led by sort of customer feedback right um and people saying hey we need this um we want it and us then kind of going internally and saying well how good a job do we think we can do of it and if we can do a good job let's let's prioritize that because you know it makes this this customer we've already got happy and it would likely find you know many other happy customers that makes sense, and that's probably why your customers are happy. Is and the product has progressed so well because you're you're giving them what they're asking for. So let's switch to team. So how did you go about building your team, and, and what did you look for in those people to indicate that they were the winning horses to join you? That's another thing that's really evolved. I guess initially I was very happy to be doing it sort of by myself as a as a side project, um, and you had no, uh, you know, we're a bootstrap business. So obviously, what happens with a lot of venture back business or whatever they raise a bunch of money and then like hey let's 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 build out a team with ipinfo that that never sort of happened and it started with me you know very part time on it doing it a few hours a week to you know demanding more and more of my time and then getting to a point where you know there just wasn't enough hours in the day for for me to be doing this by myself um and then there were areas that i needed help on that, that either weren't my skill set or things i didn't have time for and so that happened pretty organically um you know it got to a point where um yeah, say say with customer support, you know, that we're just getting more and more support requests, um, and the same ones over and over again. Uh, and so then, you know, I initially went and found some people on Upwork um, to help with you know specific things. Oh, hey, you know, can you help do some some customer support requests? Um, and it just worked really well. You know, that like I I would with the customer support request coming in, uh, you know, I was short on time. I would sometimes get frustrated with the requests, right? Like, hey, your documentation sucks. And you know, it's, it's tough to, to not take that personally and be like, what's wrong with our documentation, you know? Um, whereas someone that, that you know, you're hiring to work on support, they can be like, oh, thanks for the feedback. That's great feedback. You know, what would you like us to uh, to change? Uh, so you're being that, that little more removed from it. They can kind of give a, a much better, do a much better job of, of support. Um, and so gradually outsource things like that, right? And so it'd be a, a part-time person helping with support. Uh, and then it's like, well, hey, you know, our design really sucks, right? Let's get some some part time help with design. And then on the engineering side, sort of bring in specialists, right? So um, we would have a database query that would you know maybe take too long to run, and so bring in a database specialist, um, you know, paid per hour that could come, hey come in tune tune some database queries, speed up performance. And so for a while, then it was sort of me working on it with a bunch of contractors working on specific tasks, um, and that sort of scaled for a while. Um, but I think the, the big shift was then bringing people on full time, right? Um, who could kind of really, um, you know, give all their attention and, and focus to to the project and, and you know, move things forward. Um, and for that, a lot of people that we ended up bringing onto the team started part time. And so, you know, some of these sort of part time people that help with custom support um, were just really, really great and, and really strong and doing a great job and, and coming up with ideas and, and you know, wanting to, to get more involved. And so a lot of the initial full-time team were people that had started on those projects and, and just done you know, a really incredible job. Um, and you know, it was great to bring them on full-time. And then as we've grown as a bigger team, uh, we, you know, now a lot of our recruiting is you know, online. Um, you know, we're, we're, as the whole world is, is remote kind of first now you're with, with COVID and with, with lockdowns and everything. Um, but we've been that from the start, you know, so it was, that was, I guess when we bring on full-time people a couple of years ago, that was, um, your compelling reason to join us. It's like, Hey, we're remote, we're, we're global. Um, and so you were able to find some, some really great people that, that wanted to come work on IP info. And, you know, we've got people all around the world in, in, you know, Russia, Australia, uh, Canada, people all around the globe. And so that's, that's been a, a fun way to kind of meet a bunch of people and get a bunch of people um, all working on the, on the project together. This episode is sponsored by Radable. Are you interested in joining a team that encourages intellectual curiosity, problem solving, and openness? Not only that, but one that provides the support and mentorship needed to succeed, learn, and grow? Meet Radable. The team at Radable has built a world-class platform for modern bill payments, payouts, and invoicing. 
Routable helps companies speed up their business payments using a secure invoice and bill payment system. And not just for accounting groups, the company is solving problems for the CFO, controller, the accountant, and the developer. Routable is engineering-led and fully remote. They're looking for the best engineers and operators to join their team and drive forward their mission of removing the burden of business payments. To apply today, go to routable.com slash about and click view open roles. That's R-O-U-T-A-B-L-E dot com slash about. Check out Routable today and join a team who's changing the face of business payments. This episode is brought to you by CTO.AI. You guys know that I interview a lot of great builders on this show. And one of the most important aspects of a great code story episode is how a team works together to continuously deliver a great product. And not only just a great product, but one that will scale to meet growing demand. It's easy for growing teams to get overwhelmed by, you know it, complex tools. Complex tools can be a major source of frustration across a team to spend all of your time managing tools instead of building great products. Meet CTO.AI. CTO.AI is a workflow automation platform that simplifies developer operations so your growing team can improve their delivery velocity and hit their launch dates. What I love about the platform is that it doesn't matter your experience level. You can be a junior dev, you can be a senior dev, it doesn't matter. The platform allows any developer to build powerful workflow tools and share them across their team. You can do this using their services, pipelines, commands, and insights tools to create your singular workflow in a powerful way. You can easily release code anywhere directly from Slack. It's where you live anyway. Automate live previews of new feature changes and measure your integration, your CICD, cadence, and stability of all of your products. So who uses CTO.AI? The best and most sought after startups in the land. CTO.AI has helped fast-growing startups who've raised over half a billion dollars in funding to scale their software delivery workflows. Find out how they can help your team workflow smarter, not harder, by visiting go.cto.ai slash code story. Well, let's flip to scalability then. So did you build this to scale efficiently in that first MVP or first prototype, or are you fighting this as you grow? We were pretty scalable to start with, so we've gone through some some big shifts. In general, it was always designed to scale, and like I say, you know, initially the API was was you know I think within the first month or so we're getting sort of millions of requests a day, um, and it was always built on fairly scalable infrastructure um, so that it could scale up. Um, but there have been some big infrastructure shifts as we've as we've changed. Some of the things were always designed up front, so you know, our rate limiting was was sort of always asynchronous. We've always assumed, hey, you know, if if the, you're eliminating points of failure, so hey, if our rate limiting infrastructure went down, or well, hey, you know, we we fail open, so people can make more requests than they maybe should be allowed. But you know, if 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 that thing fails, our paying customers should have things work, right? We never want to fail closed so that, you know, it's much better to, to give away a few extra requests than you know, upset all our paying customers. And so all of those kind of design considerations were um, intentional and, and designed up front. So that's definitely served us well. But I think there have been a bunch of, of, of big shifts. I guess, you know, initially we maybe went too far in thinking about scalability. So one thing we thought of at the very beginning was, oh, hey, you know, what if what if one provider goes down, right? Let's let's make sure we're on a diff- bunch of different providers. And so I think the first version we had some servers on DigitalOcean and some on Linode and uh, some somewhere else. And then we sort of round robin with DNS across the different providers. But it turned out that was just sort of a, a headache, right? Um, to to ma- manage and maintain all that. And then it's like, well, you know, how much of an issue is it really? You know, what are the chances of... of, of these providers going down um, and sort of over-indexed on, well, hey, you know, if, if DigitalOcean goes down, we'll still have some Linux servers, but it just kind of added a bunch of complexity and cost to us. Uh, and so then we eliminated that and we shifted over to, to AWS um, and we were using, I think it was Elastic Beanstalk there for a while. Uh, and at that point, we we're like, hey, let's, let's make sure we're available in all these different regions all over the world. So we've got low latency and, and thought that was really important. Um, but then what happened was, that added again a ton of cost and complexity and things 
Um, and you know, we, we went out and asked some customers, you know, how important is this really to you? Um, and it turned out it wasn't actually that important, right? These things were, but on paper, it's like, yeah, low latency anywhere in the globe is great. You know, high availability in case an AWS region goes down is really great. But it was really slowing us down in terms of, you know, launching new features. Uh, it was it was adding a bunch of costs. Um, and so then we, we finally switched over to Google Cloud. Uh, we just went to single region and that just simplified so many things. Um, we were worried initially, you know, we did some, some, some research with some customers and asked how much they would care. Um, so we, we, we kind of tried it carefully, but once we, we shifted, we thought, you know, maybe it caused some issues or there might be some negative feedback, but it, it wasn't at all. Uh, you know, we, we had no one say, oh, you know, I noticed you, you had some servers in Australia and you don't anymore. It, it was, seemed to be a total non-issue. And so I think if anything, we sort of planned for scale um, in a way that was, was sort of slowing our progress and sort of had to shift back a bit to say... Well, hey, we, we, we do want to be scalable. We do want to make sure we can kind of cope with cope with growth, but not necessarily at the expense of being able to experiment and, and ship things quickly um, and you know, pay a bunch of actual server costs for that. So we sort of, I guess, kind of scaled that back a little bit, if anything. So as you step out on the balcony and you look across all that you've built with IP Info, what, what are you most proud of? I guess that the whole package is, is the bit I'm really proud of, right? I guess that the company itself, right? The team we've put together, the the happy customers we've got, um, you know, that I guess that the whole company is, is the bit I'm really proud of. And I guess as well, um, that in some ways felt like the you know, the, the bit we weren't necessarily focused on, right? The bit I was focused on always has been, hey, the product, right? Let's let's build this great API, let's build this great data, um, and you know, let's make our customers happy. But what we've kind of built to support that's this you know, amazing team, an amazing set of products, um, you know, amazing roadmap. Um, and I guess that's the sort of the engine that continues to to, to build the product and you know, attract new customers and, and new people to join our team. So I think that's definitely the thing that, that I'm most proud of is I guess the you know the the company and the the team we've got. Let's flip the script a little bit. Tell me about a mistake you made and how you and your team responded to it. One of the main mistakes we made, I think, was not capturing email addresses of free users early on. So the, the IP Info has a, it's a freemium offering. We have a free API that allows for you know anybody to make up to a thousand requests a day, completely for free, without even registering for an API token. And you know the the thinking behind that was, like I say, when I launched the very first version, hey, this will be used by hobbyists and developers. Let's make it really easy to use. You don't even need to sign up. Um, you know, you can just just get going, call it through a command line or a simple bit of code, uh, and, and you know everything will work great. And I think that was. That was true, and you know, that was part of our initial success was that it was so easy to use. But we we made it so that you couldn't even sign up if, you, if you're on the free plan. The only way you could kind of give us an email address is if you were going to be a paying customer. Uh, and then you're, obviously that ended up being something that we didn't fix for a couple of years. Um, and it, we suddenly got to this point where we said, hey, you know, we, we think we have you know hundreds of thousands of free users using the free plan. Uh, but at that point, I think we had you know hundreds of paying users. But as we're launching these sort of new features and, and you know new products, we had no way to reach out to all these free users that you know, loved the free offering, but no way to even kind of communicate, hey, here's all the new cool stuff we're doing, um, or you know uh, if they hit a rate limit, you know no way to get in touch and be like, hey, by the way, you know you're approaching a rate limit and you know things may break if you don't don't make some adjustments. Um, and so yeah, it was, it was it kind of felt very late that we even gave an option for free users to sign up, create accounts. Uh, and obviously give us a way to tell them about new offerings, but also tell them, hey, you know, you, you may be approaching a rate limit or, you know, stay in touch with them. Um, and that sort of, at the time, felt, you know, as a, a sort of a real facepalm moment where it's like, wow, you know, we've got these hundreds of thousands of free users that we've never even given a, the ability for them to get in touch with us. Um, that, you know, how, how have we sort of missed this for so long? And, and you know, quickly corrected that so you know now you can sign up for free plans that the unauthenticated plan is, is still completely available you can make a thousand free requests a day without signing up um but we've got this you know free offering where you can sign up create an account your know, manager account all that good stuff without having to be a paid user with ip info what does the future look like for you know for the product and for your team yeah so i think the two big areas we continue to focus on and, and you know that kind of guide our roadmap at this point uh, improving our data. You know, we've got really great high quality geolocation data and all the different data sets, but a huge area of focus is to continue to improve those. You know, improve the coverage of cell VPN data sets, improve the accuracy of our geolocation. And so that's a huge focus. The other focus is, uh, you know, goes right back to the beginning, right? Making it really easy to get data. Initially, that was a, a, a free API. Um, and 
now it, the focus on that is you know, product integrations, um, SDKs, you're making your data available in, in data marketplaces and, and you're making sure that if, if there's a developer or someone that needs our data in a certain certain place within a certain product or you know, a certain database or whatever, um, you know, an API isn't always the best way to do that. So you're know, trying to integrate into products and services so that we're the easiest data to get hold of in, in really easy ways. And that, that generally guides our roadmap, right? It's like make our data better and make it more accessible. And so that those those are things that, that really drive it. And you're continuing to build up a team to kind of support those things. Well, Ben, let's switch to you. Who influences the way that you work? You know, CEO, CTO, architect, really any person you look up to and why? I look up to a bunch of different businesses. And so one that I really like is is Automatic, uh, Matt Mullenweg uh, that, that runs that. And you're obviously massively successful business. Um, you're with built sort of around the open source WordPress. Um, but what I really like about that is the way that they're a, you know, a globally distributed team. Um, they put out a lot of content about how they how they organize themselves, how they structure it, the fact that they're a fractal business. Um, Matt's got a great podcast um, that, that interviews different people that run different sort of remote teams. Uh, I think I've learned a lot from from that and, and sort of how Automatic operates. I think that's really inspirational. Well, We talked about a mistake, but a little bit different spin. If you could go back to the beginning, what would you do differently? Or where would you consider taking a different approach? One of those things is the mistake, right? Making sure that we we would capture those emails, I think, is is one obvious thing. I think what I would do differently um, from the start is I think I'd be more intentional about building the team. Like I say, I was sort of focused on, hey, here's a great product. Let's focus on the product. Uh, Let's make that great. And, um, you know, build out the company and the organization to support that over time i think going back if i was to start again it'd be like well hey this clearly needs a team let's be more intentional about kind of getting ahead of that um and building that up front well last question ben so you're getting on a plane and you're sitting next to a young entrepreneur who's built the next big thing they're jazzed about it they can't wait to show it off to the world can't wait to show it off to you right there on the plane what advice do you give that person having gone down this road a bit I think one thing I would probably, I, I definitely wouldn't want to kill their enthusiasm. I think that would be, you know, I, I'd love to be, give them positive feedback about what they're building. What I would say is it's really hard to know what's going to be successful in advance, right? I think, you know, the, for, for me, the, the, the success of IP Info came as a huge surprise, right? Uh, you know, I, I launched it as a small thing for developers and suddenly got a lot of traction. Um, in the past, you know, I've launched many, many different side projects that I was sure were going to be successful and, you know, some of them had moderate success. Many of them went absolutely nowhere. Um, and so I guess I would say that you know, almost nobody can know in advance if something's going to be really successful or not, right? And so I think that, that enthusiasm is amazing. But I guess I would say if it doesn't work out, you know, don't feel dejected, right? Keep going um, and you know, listen to the customers um, and you know, keep going. And, and hey, if this project doesn't work out, they're, they're keep going and, and something likely will. And it's really hard to know what that's going to be, right? Um, but I, yeah, I would, I, would, I would try and be, be really positive and, and, and kind of keep up that enthusiasm. I think that's actually the, the key thing, right? Whether this project works out or not, if you've got that enthusiasm, you can keep shipping and, and, and launch something eventually that, that, that hits a nerve. That's great advice. Well, Ben, thank you for being on the show today. Thank you for telling the creation story of IP Info. Thanks, no, I really appreciate it. And this concludes another chapter of Code Story. Code Story is hosted and produced by Noah Laphart. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or the podcasting app of your choice. Support the show on patreon.com slash code story for just five to ten bucks a month. And when you get a chance, leave us a review. Both things help us out tremendously. And thanks again for listening. This episode of Code Story is sponsored by Cloudways. Cloudways is a managed hosting platform ideal for small to medium businesses, e-commerce, and agencies. Because with Cloudways, they don't have to worry about managing or maintaining servers and can instead focus on their business. Cloudways offers peace of mind to business owners with reliable 24-7 support and managed backups. Their custom stack has integrated cache and performance boosting tech that will improve page load times, which is super important. 
With Cloudways, customers have the freedom and flexibility to deploy PHP apps from a list of five cloud providers in just a few clicks. Those providers are AWS, DigitalOcean, Linode, Google Cloud, and Voltaire. They can scale their servers up or down any way they want. Cloudways has a lot of features that makes development and deployment on the cloud much easier and faster. Features like integrated Git, a staging environment, team collaboration tools, a pre-configured composer, and free SSL. That's right, free. Use the promo code CODE30 and get up to two months of free hosting with a $30 credit. That's promo code CODE30. Take a look at their website today at cloudways.com.